All right, folks, if I can get you guys to come back into the room, we're going to get uh, started with plenary session two. I hope lunch went well for everyone, and I hope the uh, concurrent sessions were, uh, were also a success and enjoyable. Um, certainly the one I sat in on was great. So, so we're going to move on to plenary session two. The title of this plenary session is On the Bias, Addressing Kidney Care Team Perceptions Towards Hemodialysis towards home dialysis, I should say. And we have a panel, as you can see, that is a, uh, gathered around here. I'd like to introduce Dr. Sunit Singh, first of all. She's the co-chair of this session with me. Dr. Singh is the provincial lead for peritoneal dialysis in British Columbia and a full-time clinician at Vancouver General Hospital. Um, and uh, Dr. Singh will introduce the first couple of our, patient, uh, of our panel members. Good thing I wore the high heels today again. They're much less frequently in use than they used to be, I'm sad to say. Um, and uh, Dr. Copeland has kindly um, given me some cheat sheets, which he, assured, which he assured me were in large font. But anyway, um, so I'd like to start off by uh, introducing Dr. Uh, Jeff Pearl. Um, Jeff comes to us from Toronto. He is a staff nephrologist at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto and an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is a recipient of the John Maher Young Investigator Award from the International Society for PD. And I'm just gonna ad lib a tiny bit here for anybody who reads ISPD knows that he is um, the journal for the ISPD. Um, Jeff has established a home dialysis fellowship at his institution and uh, has also personally received several teaching awards within University of Toronto and St. Michael's Hospital. He's the Editor-in-Chief of Peritoneal Dialysis International and recently co-chaired the KDGO Guidelines on Home Dialysis a Controversies Conference. Um, so I'd like to welcome Jeff to the uh, podium. You were going to do all? Sorry, Jeff, you're not allowed to come up yet. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, apparently I'm introducing one after the other. Um, our speaker after Jeff then will be Dr. Chris Poynen. Um, so uh, Chris is um, a homegrown person. He's from, actually... Yeah, mostly from BC. Um, he's currently a clinical nephrologist and home hemodialysis lead within the Island Health Program in Victoria. He completed his MD in nephrology fellowship at UBC um, and several programs including internal medicine with the University of Calgary, home therapies training with uh, UBC, a master's of health administration at UBC, and a QI certificate program through the University of Toronto. His interests include home dialysis therapies, quality improvement, and spending time with his two young uh, boys um, and his family. Nick? Okay. I'll introduce the other speakers. Uh, so Sarah Faulkner uh, is uh, uh, one of our panel speakers as well. Uh, Sarah graduated nursing school in 2002 in the United Kingdom. She's from rugby for rugby fans out there. Um, uh, and she uh, worked in the perineal dialysis unit at the University Hospital in Coventry and Warwickshire. Uh, she started work at uh, Island Health in 2007 after moving to Canada, um, has experience in acute medicine, hemodialysis, uh, home hemodialysis, and peritoneal dialysis, and she's currently the clinical nurse leader with the Royal Jubilee Hospital uh, Home Dialysis Clinic uh, with a special interest in PD and improving the lives of uh, her patients. We have Eldon Ma, who is one of our patient partners who's joining us today. Uh, Eldon is currently a peritoneal dialysis patient at Vancouver General Hospital, but has had experience both in peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Uh, he's 62. Uh, he started dialysis in 2018. Um, uh, he started with hemodialysis and then switched to peritoneal dialysis in 2020. Uh, he was previously working as a, uh, a driver uh, and a warehouse worker, but because of his health, uh, he's uh, left that and now focuses on his perineal dialysis. And then we have Dino Angelucci, uh, who is a registered nurse uh, for 30 years um, at Vancouver General Hospital. 25 of those years have been in dialysis. Um, he's worked as a hemodialysis nurse for much of that time, uh, but now works as a nurse educator in the PD program. Uh, and he has recently been hired as one of the HESS nurses for uh, Vancouver General Hospital. And when I asked him uh, what he wanted me to say, he said, and I quote, he is a member of the best soccer nation on the planet, end quote. But I was confused by that because he's actually Italian and not Argentinian. But... <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Dr. Pearl on that note to, to leave the talk. Um, 
Good afternoon, everybody. It's really an honor to, to be here. And I must say, what I thought of in my mind was a lot smaller and less, you know, um, glamorous than the, the BC Kidney Days uh, event it is. And it's great to see so many people here. Um, and it's really an honor to be part of the panel. Uh, Chris and I's job is really just to introduce the topic, get you thinking about it, but the real stars of the show um, are going to be the panel discussion and all your um, insightful comments and questions after. Um, so I th thought about this topic during my fellowship, actually, when I was introduced to somebody and it's like, oh, who's that? And I'm like, that's Dr. Bargman. She's a PD person. And I'm like, well, why are there PD and hemonephrologists? Um, you know, when we're thinking about offering these therapies to both, to all of our patients, um, you know, if our patients are going to make decisions, we really want to make sure that we give fair, balanced uh, education around different therapy options. And we do so unbiased. But I'm going to challenge everybody and say, is there such thing as unbiased modality education? When we're talking to our patients, we all have our own experiences, we all have our own knowledge, we all have our own education. And I might challenge and say, as much as we try to provide a fair balanced view, we do come to the table with certain biases. And I you know when I'm educating patients, you know, these are my disclosures. These are the drug companies that um, I've provided a consultation for that I'm supposed to disclose to you. I should also disclose to patients that I really believe in home dialysis and that's my area of expertise. That's where I do research. That's, you know, I fundamentally come with a very different perspective perhaps than somebody else who might be providing modality education. So. Whenever I preface a modality education session with a patient or their family members, I definitely explain to them the background that I'm coming from so that they understand uh, the perspective it's coming from. So in preparing for this talk, I thought about, you know, what are perceptions? Um, you know, perceptions can be positive, they can be negative, um, and perceptions may certainly impact preferences. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about the renal team, uh, and I think it's important that we all play a role in modality education, whether we, we know it or not. Um, nurses, technicians, physicians, and allied health, each of us gains a little bit into uh, the insights into how patients are, uh, what patients are thinking about, what's important to patients. And I think it, as Chris will highlight in his talk, it's really um, a team approach. So I participated in the KDGO uh, Controversies Conference on, uh, on um, home dialysis utilization. The whole idea was in many parts of the world, we're not using home dialysis quite as much as we could be. And does that suggest that there's many barriers or challenges uh, to uh, home dialysis utilization? And one of the ones you can see here is actually factors that are related to physician and treatment team bias. And I do believe um, that bias exists and that we all come to the table um, with our own perceptions around home dialysis. And that was something that we identified among a whole host of factors. And uh, this survey was asked um, at, at a kidney conference quite a while ago. Um, and for a typical patient aged 65 years with one comorbidity, and this was asked to physicians at the meeting, what would you consider to be the best initial dialysis therapy for this patient? And of course, what best means is obviously different to different people. Um, and these were the, the treatment choices. And if you, you take a look here, um, the proportion of kidney care practitioners who actually chose PD as the best initial dialysis therapy for a typical patient is way different than the actual number of patients who actually receive PD. So why is there this difference? And then another question actually asked them what they would choose for themselves. And a vast majority chose a home therapy. So what, what's explaining this gap between what they perceive to be a therapy for themselves, but perhaps what ends up happening is a, a very different distribution of use of home dialysis. Um, and, and so there is that gap. Um, I think that physician bias is definitely um, the elephant in the room. Um, and over the years, I've uh, collected a number of emails and messages that have been sent to me over the years um, in discussing various aspects about home dialysis. So let me share with you these are real things that have been said to me by my colleagues um, about a peritoneal dialysis. So the first one, uh, one of my favorites, is PD stands for pre-dialysis, okay? Not really thinking it's a real therapy. Second, PD is a good therapy while the patient has residual kidney function, but put a fistula in when the patient becomes aneuric. 
I've heard this one, the patient's too large for PD, he'll be uremic. Um, when PD works, it's great. When it doesn't, it's a disaster. Um, and then the last one was actually also one of my favorites. PD is a second-rate therapy given to third-rate patients by fourth-rate doctors. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, these are nephrologists practicing out there who are going to start patients on dialysis. And is this really a fair, balanced view towards PD? And I would argue that it isn't. I'm going to actually share one that didn't make it to the presentation that happened last week. Um, I had a slide that said, you know, um, the mediocre nephrologist prevents peritonitis and the, the, the mediocre nephrologist treats peritonitis, the superior nephrologist prevents peritonitis, and I got a text message saying, no, the superior nephrologist avoids peritoneal dialysis altogether um, in the middle of that talk from one of my colleagues. So the biases exist. And what we bring to the table is, is something that we need to be thinking about when we're educating our patients around home dialysis. And it should be a choice that's personalized, involving a shared decision-making approach between us and patients. And it's the modality that they choosing, choose after receiving dialysis education and support. What kind of modality education do you think the nephrologists in the previous slide are providing? What kind of biased education, whether it's as explicit as I just showed you, or really sort of uh, not as, as overt as you can imagine. And I think that when I think about how bias impacts perceptions, we do have perceptions about the ideal PD candidate. You know, a young person without comorbidities who maybe has a huge family support or, you know, whisks around the world and travels and uh, wants to be able to do home dialysis, lives in a big house and that's not an issue and works and has good residual kidney function. But in my mind, the idea is anybody who thinks that they're going to gain a quality of life benefit from doing dialysis at home should be offered home dialysis. And I'd argue that there's many people on in center that probably would have gained the benefits of a home therapy that may have been blown off by the team as not an ideal candidate than exist people at home who probably, you know, you know, I, I'd let, if somebody goes home and it doesn't work out for them, that's something that at least I know they've tried it and they've potentially gained the benefit. But I worry more about the person on in-center coming four hours, three times a week, who really could have had a better quality of life with more support and education. And, that, and that's the real concern here. And so I really hate the term patient selection for home dialysis. Sometimes you'll see talks that say, patient selection for home dialysis. Um, and I think that's sort of a PD of the past uh, nomenclature, that we had to select the right patient. Or, or, or when people say that's a good PD candidate, I think that that is implicitly providing you know, some degree of judgment on who can or can't do PD. And I think that many more patients can do independent dialysis than we give people credit for. And so I think modern PD is really all about patients selecting the right therapy. And how can we think outside the box to make solutions for patients that face challenges uh, to doing dialysis at home? And I know that there's been several assisted PD projects um, in BC and assisted PD is very well established in Ontario. So that's the kind of outside the box thinking we need to make the therapy fit the patient not necessarily think about patients who fit the therapy. And we know, and this is uh, also true in Canada as well, um, that ethnicity impacts and race impacts home dialysis utilization. And I think part of that might, might be, and again, I'm challenging this, but how much of this could be bias and perceptions about who can and can't do home dialysis and how does that impact different degrees of utilization? And I think that that's something we need to work to make sure that everybody has equitable access to home dialysis. But there's a tight link with education and perceptions. And some nephrologists just really aren't comfortable with PD. Let's face it, um, PD, hemo orders are easy. We tell what the K-bath is gonna be, how much fluid to remove, you know, how long it's gonna be. I mean, you basically just say, do this and it happens. PD, you gotta think, it's a little bit more, um, it requires a little bit more insight into the biology of the membrane, the prescriptions, the lifestyle. There's a lot of, you know, balls in the air and people get uncomfortable with that because a default pathway is hemo. And so many people become really uncomfortable um, with PD. So if you're uncomfortable with PD, how likely are you as a nephrologist going to offer it to your patient? And I think that that's a key problem here. And this is a survey from the US, and I don't know about uh, data from Canada, that um, 
um, you know, when you looked at nephrology fellows who finished their training, guess what the two areas that they wanted more education in leaving fellowship, home hemo and PD. And this was a survey that we did in the, uh, the DOP study, which is a large study of uh, PD units in, um, around the world and in hemodialysis units. And guess what? When we asked medical directors of hemodialysis programs, how, how often or how likely would you be to um, consider PD for such patient populations consistently with all the patient population groups like diabetics, older patients, patients who've had surgery in the past, um, consistently, the hemodialysis medical directors were less likely to recommend PD for these patients than, of course, the PD uh, medical directors who were more likely to recommend PD. So already, different perceptions impact who people perceive can and can't do PD. And really, I think that that highlights a big challenge. So just to summarize the sort of uh, way I think it works, you know, we have perceptions about PD that definitely are influenced by our knowledge and experience. Uh, I think that knowledge and experience about PD um, definitely impacts who we feel can be eligible for the therapy. And so we end up creating this vicious cycle where if we don't improve knowledge and experience, we're not going to change mindsets about eligibility and we're gonna to continue to drive different perceptions about PD. And, and in this study, uh, which Matt Oliver did, um, who's um, a nephrologist in Ontario, he looked at systematically what were viewed as contraindications to PD. And, and in this study, uh, what, we, what you can see here is abdominal scarring was viewed as the number one contraindication to PD when nephrologists were systematically asked about patients approaching the need for dialysis, why they perceived it was. And I just want to point out that that's an a relative contraindication. You can do PD in patients um, with prior abdominal surgery. And just to, to show you, in our center, this patient was turned down by three programs before uh, we were willing to consider this patient for PD because we had access to laparoscopic catheter insertion. We could do adhesiolysis. And this patient had a congenital kidney uh, challenge with multiple surgeries as a child and did PD successfully um, until he was able to uh, get a kidney transplant from his father. So I just want to point out that, you know, some programs would have completely blown this patient off. It's a perception about who can and can't do PD. This is a, with permission, I'm on some of the, the social media uh, groups, uh, patients. This is, again, another patient who told me that he was turned down by a program and sought a program that could facilitate PD for him um, when one program turned him down. And again, it's not, prior surgery is not a contraindication to PD, especially if you have access to advanced laparoscopic catheter placement. And of course, a big challenge now is getting access to PD access. Um, this is a, a, a position paper that uh, Matt Oliver wrote during the COVID pandemic. Again, if we have these resources, we can certainly offer PD uh, to many more individuals. So I'm going to add like a third element to this. You know, we have perceptions about PD, knowledge and eligibility. But the other big thing is resources and clinical outcomes. If you're a nephrologist that works in a program or a nurse or any member of the allied health, and day after day you see poor PD access outcomes and non-functioning catheters and challenges, then you see the next patient. How likely are you to offer PD or think about PD in somebody where you consistently are having poor outcomes? It can be demoralizing to a program. So the second piece of this is we need to make sure that we're monitoring our performance and we're driving, we have the resources to obtain really good clinical outcomes. And I think that this sort of, in my mind, completes the picture. Just gonna to finish by you know, saying this is a case, an 87-year-old woman with dementia who lived in an apartment. Her daughter was in a condo on another floor, developed kidney failure and was on dialysis. And the, family cho the, uh, the nephrologist strongly suggested in-center hemo because of her dementia and her inability to potentially do PD at home. But I just wanna point out there's another side of the coin. She was thrashing on dialysis. She couldn't sit still and was constantly asking to come off early. And PD was never discussed with the family. And the family increasingly found transportation difficult. And nephrologist said, whenever home PD is deemed safe, a very relative term, I always let the patient choose. But in this case, I think an 87-year-old living at home with no supports close at hand would make me lose sleep. 
And of course, this patient ended up doing assisted PD, had a nurse come in to do two out of the three exchanges. The family did the third exchange and did PD very successfully uh, for two years. And so we have these barriers to self-care. And again, if we're going to improve access to PD, we need to think about providing home care assistance to, to address these barriers to self-care. And in the province of Ontario, um, we have access to home care for, for the majority of our patients. There's still challenges in rural communities. And you can see that you know, who you can offer PD to and who receives PD goes up. And I think it changes the narrative on offering PD to a wide range of candidates. So when I add that piece about resources, from in my mind, assisted PD and access to um, various methods of PD catheter insertion is that additional resource, I think, that allows us to hopefully change minds on perceptions. And this was a, a great commentary uh, about frail elderly patients, and this was really rang true for my patient here. Um, it really is the choice of two evils, and it's really, you know, perhaps in many of these cases, a conservative strategy would be appropriate, but we need to be thinking about all patient options. There is a culture, and Simon, in Simon Davies' session just now, we talked about the culture you know, in-center hemodialysis perceptions and PD perceptions. And in Ontario, we see a distribution in different amounts of uh, proportion of patients doing home dialysis. In my mind, it's no coincidence that the sort of PD nephrologists have programs that have high rates of PD utilization, and maybe other programs may not necessarily have a champion. So I think each program needs to have a home dialysis champion and work with the team. And I just want to say one last thing. The pendulum can swing in the other direction too. And I just want to point out from Australian work um, what a patient said about moda the modality decision process that they underwent. I wanted to be on hemo. I didn't want to be on CAPD. But he, the physician, said the decision is yours to make. But I felt like the decision wasn't mine to make because he wanted me to say that I wanted PD. You have to agree to be on peritoneal dialysis. You have to agree to whatever they want to do. If you don't agree to what they want, what, what they want to agree to, they won't accept your answer until you agree to what they want to hear. That's the way it works. So obviously, it can swing the other direction. And we really have to find fair, balanced education. So to conclude, we all have our own perceptions about home dialysis from our own prior experiences. I think we should disclose these to our patients in whom we're providing education and their care partners and families. I think that perceptions are driven by definitely impact who we perceive as eligible. And I think that resources, knowledge, and education are really the way to combat those perceptions and biases. Thank you. Hello, everyone. All right, so thank you, Dr. Pearl, for uh, setting the stage. That was a good build up to what I will be transitioning to in chat, speaking with you about today. Uh, really, it's about reflection and uh, understanding that there are biases present. And I will be speaking about similar themes, but with a di different little spin and more focused on the team aspect. And then later we'll speak a little bit more about overcoming biases, or at least a, a way of that. So uh, here we are, part two, overcoming biases. No disclosures for today. And so why change? Deming, there. so Deming said this uh, quote, every system is perfectly designed to get the outcomes that it does. And so when we're faced with this, uh, we had looked at our system and our team and our perceptions of uh, home therapies amongst uh, the, the renal team. And we did this study where we surveyed uh, numerous renal team members, including that of nephrologists, nurses in various fields such as pre-dialysis care, home therapies, and uh, in-center hemodialysis as well. And this is a buildup of other surveys that have been done, but locally. And part of what I want to do today is sprinkle some of our local um, efforts and to highlight these as well. Uh, so 
this is one of the surveys. What we also, in addition, what was novel is we looked at the allied health and a group of dietitians, uh, pharmacists, technicians, and uh, social work that were involved in here. So we asked for their opinions as well. And so with this survey, when we asked this group what their thoughts were on home therapies for specific patients based on these patient level parameters, such as advanced age, English as a second language, multiple comorbidities, or even system level factors such as cost, such as safety, and such as workload. And what we found was when you asked what modality they would prefer for each of the parameters, that there were gaps, there were discrepancies amongst which one would be favored for each of these factors. And so that highlighted that amongst our renal care team, there were certain uh, discrepancies in terms of their approach to home therapies for specific factors. And there's a gap. There's a gap there of how we uh, evaluate patients for suitability based on these parameters. We also asked, you know, would there be a willingness to have further education in regards to home therapies to hopefully shore up these gaps? And there was. So we'll what we're saying here as well is that, you know, we talked a bit about the nephrologist. We're also looking at the team and that there are biases uh, present. So how do we go about approaching bias? And one path that I'd like to elaborate upon is a combination of having uh, more, uh, all, all members being informed, um, having more standardized processes, and looking for ongoing ways to improve that process where possible. So much like what we've heard today, and as an, an echoing of the same sentiments, is that we reframe our focus uh, to the patient and have patient-led care. And if we, we do this by performing um, shared decision-making, um, where you know, you're informing as best as we can for rigorous education, having ongoing discussions, times for the uh, communication to answer questions, uh, be it from the patient or the family, and then, but also looking at the patient priorities. And one of my colleagues on the island is, you know, we're very prominent at asking what matters most to you. And that's an impactful question because it does help elaborate what uh, we should be focused on and what we should be aiming for. This also respects the patient's autonomy. We also know that informed patients who uh, are involved in their own choice of modality tend to do better. And when they are faced with complications, they are more resilient to overcome it because of that empowerment. Further, if they stay on the treatment uh, modality longer, there's likely less impact potentially with cost and resources and, and down the line. How do we go about this? Again, uh, it's great to hear that there's a lot of reoccurring themes from the talks that I've heard today, um, but we're, we're speaking with, not at the patients. We're uh, using appropriate language and ex explanatory tools. We're changing that power balance and involving them more on, a, on the same level. Um, we're sensitive to cultural uh, aspects. And uh, as we mentioned recently, there might be uh, differences in our initial choice and what may fit best, but it's, it's good to navigate these conflicts in decision and spending the time to understand more what the patient is, is uh, wish coming from. And so this uh, goes back to um, educating, educating the patients, how we deliver, how, when we deliver education, what's the standardized material and tools that we use, Especially here, there's the, the transition guides that have been used, and so making it a little bit more structured in that sense. Uh, we have peer experiences, and we've heard uh, from earlier uh, from one of our panel members how impactful hearing from another patient who's gone through the similar journey and how that can resonate with them. And as a, as a whole, just hearing about the success stories in terms of transitioning to home Perhaps there was a barrier that was placed and that particular patient or uh, the group was able to overcome it and hearing about it and carrying that positivity as well, that it shows it's more feasible to, to transition to home. And then we also mentioned, uh, or was discussed earlier, just the holistic nature of care. These patients be it, uh, will be going through some difficult times and some transitioning. 
Um, and there is inertia at times where it's easier to just stay with the status quo and, and not look into to a change. But through that approach, you know, we have to be able to be more motivating and um, eye-opening for other options and see if there is a better fit for modality. And again, just looking at impacts on daily activities, impacts on their lives and their, what, uh, what they're doing day to day. And, is, and this has been shown that uh, it's a, a great um, uh, motivator for what they choose. And so we need to be able to understand how that impacts certain aspects of their care there. So it's in, in a way you're empowering the patients and making them more informed such that when they are supported by the team, we're also equally more confident in their choice of modality or how, where they're coming from. Because if they have a standardized set of education, if they're coming to you with, a, with an informed decision, it's much more comfortable to help them through and facilitate that choice or help to understand where we need to guide further or provide more education. So let's look at the team. As mentioned earlier, it's hard to um, ask someone to promote or uh, advise on a topic that they're not familiar with. As stated before, uh, there is a gap in terms of their comfort around home therapies amongst the renal team. If you're faced in that situation and you're to promote uh, an item, you will likely default to the modality or the experience you have most. Uh, which is in our uh, survey at least was in center dialysis. And through that, there are the misconceptions and the biases that prevail. So we have to help um, bridge that gap. One um, interesting aspect with that uh, survey that I showed earlier is when we included um, the allied health and looking at and asked the question to that group, who is actually, who perceives themselves as contributing to modality education. And as you can see here, the, uh, the brown and black bars are those who agree or strongly agree that they partake in uh, modality education. And we can see that, I don't have a pointer, but you can see from bottom up, we have the nephrologist, the nursing staff at various uh, parts of the program, all of which are majorly uh, feeling that they provide some education. And then interestingly, it shows that the allied health team also uh, perceived they uh, help with the modality selection journey as well. So I think that's uh, it's informative to know that we should be looking and providing all our team members with a similar or common uh, home therapies comfort. So some of the strategies to go about this, uh, first of all, just acknowledging that there are certain gaps and certain biases these can be systematic, systematic or implicit. Uh, we need to increase exposure to home therapies where possible. We have to have a comprehensive education, be it uh, as well as recurrent to ensure that it is up to date, have mechanisms for which we are uh, supporting the teams with more current evidence or research that's coming out, and perhaps even involving all team members in the decision-making aspects and the policy level of uh, uh, home therapies. We also know and we've heard pockets of perhaps one patient was not uh, declined at three centers but went to a fourth. So perhaps in that example, it's important to learn from all the different programs and see how they mitigated that barrier and learn from it. So that's another example of the cross uh, sharing there. The next question is, you know, do these educational interventions actually work? Do these um, intensified you know, home therapies, uh, education, if we sent in a, uh, one of the nurses to um, instruct and uh, educate staff about home therapies, does it work? And there have been a few studies looking at uh, dedicated in, uh, education interventions, which have shown positive uh, outcomes. And so I just want to highlight one here, which is a, a nurse-led uh, intensified education, and it was done for in-center hemodialysis nurses. As we can see here on the first set of columns, uh, before the initiative, there were lower um, candidacy rates as perceived by the team to home therapies. But after the intervention, we see a jump in the percentages that they would be more willing to place someone on home therapies 
in the same parameters after the education and after learning a bit more how to overcome some of these barriers. So they do work. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a survey that we did for our acute start project, which is just to come. But over the, as part of the crash project, we looked at, we surveyed acute starts or suboptimal start patients. And we surveyed patients and the teams as a parallel. And here what we did was on the left side, um, you'll see patients' response to a question. And they were asked, uh, do you feel a certain level of anxiety that would um, prevent you from making these dialysis um, decisions? And as you can see in the red and yellow bars, they, these are patients who said, uh, I am, or that they agree or strongly agree to being too anxious. Mind you, these are small numbers. There's only 13 uh, patients, but I would also highlight the green bar where four patients said that they um, disagree, somewhat disagree that they're too anxious and that they would be willing to entertain more education and more about uh, home therapies. As an opposite, when we looked at the team side of things, you see that uh, when we asked the team, and there was quite a few, 132 uh, team members uh, uh, that were involved, and we asked the same questions. Are acute patients, um, acute start patients or suboptimal patients, are they too anxious to make the, uh, modality decisions? And overwhelmingly, over 75%, the yellow and the red bars said that they were. Now, again, understanding that the numbers, uh, but at least to me, it would say that we can't paint every patient with the same brush, right? And if we were to individualize this and speak to the patients, there may be some that are wanting and willing to move forward and learn more and proceed to home therapies. And I think that in these cases, this is where we would uh, be, should be able to enable them to go from A to B um, in a more standardized fashion and in an uh, expedited fashion. So that leads me to standardization itself. So if we all have a common backdrop of steps and procedures, then it helps eliminate some of the subjectivity and allows us to go down a path uh, where we can get patients to the right modality if it is fitting and if it is their choice. And part of this, we should have standardization in pockets. Um, there is also uh, an idea of having some fluidity within our modalities. We know that there's not necessarily one recognized best modality for all patients. We know that there's a, a modality that's best for our patients. We also know that there's patients that um, experience two or more different types of modalities through their journey. And so perhaps it's not that uh, perhaps it's a combination of modalities over time that creates this optimal pathway for patients. And it's not so much that it's just purely the initial decision for modalities, but it's actually the initial and subsequent modality decisions that we should be looking at and be ready for. So this is a nice little diagram of that by Imbo, uh, where they show the various modalities, PD, assisted PD, home, hemo, and conventional hemodialysis and how they may intertwine. And um, as we heard from the recent uh, P PD talk just before this one, there was uh, transitioning and switching between PD and in-center. And we just have to be open to the fact that this does occur. And if someone so chooses to do home therapies later on, we should have a process by which they can go into that stream. So as Dr. Pearl mentioned, in order to grow this and be, have these processes in place, we need to have a culture and champions that are focused on home therapies and promoting this over time. We need to be able to enhance the education and the candidacy assessments of our patients to home. Uh, we also need to be realistic in our presentation as, as previously described as well, having a balanced approach of the pros and cons of home therapies so that the patients uh, understand what they're getting into and if it's truly for them. Certain populations, such as the acute start population, will require a little bit more um, guidance. Transitions, 
as I showed you with the process and the fluidity, transitions are one of the more sensitive times in that, um, in, in that model. And there's the most vulnerability at that time. And I feel that's where we should have processes in place to be adapt and to have more standardized approaches during that time of need. Some of the strategies that you may see are such things as link or navigator um, roles in the system. There's been uh, I, attempts at transitional units as well, having physical dialysis in, a, in a close proximity. And then uh, more locally, uh, we uh, tried the curriculum-based approach to standardize uh, education and the assessment. So I thought I would at least just bring this as a, as, this is a summary of the curriculum, which was a six-week program of standardized education, assessment, and documentation, and attempting to transition uh, acute starts to home therapies through that. And what we found, unfortunately I don't have a pointer, but you can see uh, there's the three phases or three different parts of the curriculum. And we had, albeit again, small numbers uh, over two sites in BC, we found that there were patients who met the criteria who went through the curriculum at the different phases and that there were some patients in the red who were able to transition to home therapies, be a PD or um, home hemo. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, there was attrition and there was attrition at the, at the forefront. There was a large drop off and yet we see it uh, attenuate as we go. And that to me means that if a patient is motivated and they're willing, they're more likely to succeed through the curriculum, which goes back to if a patient is willing and wanting to do home therapies and they're motivated uh, and we provide them the support and the structure that we can get them to home. Um, we're always striving for improvements. We need to learn from some of the, the failures as well. And, and that's why I, I mentioned uh, going through iterations of trying different processes and learning from them and then uh, improving upon it. So quality improvement plays a big part. And I think what I'm, I want to end off here is saying that we need to be able to regularly evaluate our processes, um, how we're informing patients, um, establish feedback mechanisms to hear from the team members, to hear from the patients themselves, and uh, you know, recognizing those who are doing well and then learning from our colleagues and, and other programs who are doing well. So hopefully that is a, one of the paths we can use as a little bit of an infrastructure uh, to inform, standardize, and improve upon um, home therapies and mitigate the biases that have um, crept up and that we are aware of to this day. So thank you. And now we will set the stage for the panel. All right, that was, was really great. And uh, I hope that we get a lot of questions and comments um, from the audience as well. Um, and I think um, Dr. Copeland and uh, Dr. Singh are going to manage the audience questions, yeah. correct? There will be three mics, so yeah. if there's questions, just plug in your hand. Okay. And I'll watch the slide. Okay, great. Um, Eldon, um, how, do you, how do you uh, respond to what, uh, our, our two lectures? Uh, did you experience um, any bias or any issues in um, getting education about home dialysis for yourself. You, you started off on hemodialysis, correct? Correct. And when you first started, did you get education? Why was there that sort of lag to get on to, to home dialysis? Maybe tell us a little bit about your journey. Actually, um, I had no education at all until about maybe, I say, three months into doing Nemo. They gave me the option of doing uh, community hemo or home dialysis and um, I didn't learn anything until I decided to try home dialysis and de transfer me to the independent dialysis ward. That's where I learned everything. Well, what they taught me, I learned. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, got, you got no education when you first started? None. Did you know about home dialysis till no. somebody brought it up? I didn't, I didn't know. If I knew, I would have taken it right away. Okay, so what, could, what do you think um, we can do better um, in the way we educate patients about home dialysis? I think um, 
maybe have a clinic before the people do hemo or after for maybe half an hour. Yeah. Let them know how what it's like. And I think a lot of people think it's harder than what it actually is. Like, to me, I had no idea until I switched over. And I realize now it's so easy to do it at home by myself. But I think a lot of people are scared because um, uh, I asked some different patients and they asked me what happens if something goes wrong. They, um, they're afraid something goes wrong. There's nobody there to help them. So at least at the HEMO, do you have the security of a nurse and doctors? Right. So do you think you got encouragement to do home? I encourage everybody to do home. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> right. And so what do you hear other patients say about, you know, when they're, when you, you talk to people, other patients about home dialysis? Yes. Have you ever had, what, what's some of the pushback you get from patients when uh, you're educating them about their options? What are some of the things that you've heard from patients who are from, reluctant to do it? From uh, the patients that are already doing it or not doing it? Not doing it. They're all scared because uh, they're, they're, they're home by themselves. And uh, they, they say if something goes wrong, you got nothing to fall back to. Right. So, so fear is like a big factor. Yes. And we need to, you would say that we probably need to work on strategies to help people overcome their fear. Well, yes. Plus, I think you have to show them how easy it is. Right. Great. That's great. Thanks, Eldon, for sharing that. Um, in terms of the nurses that we have on the panel as well, what have been some of your experiences with uh, colleagues or any instances where you may have had a, a negative connotations about home therapies and how you overcame it? Well, when I first started, dialysis was about, I'm really old now, so you have to forgive me. Uh, it was about 22 years ago. So when I first started dialysis, there was a patient asking another nurse about independent dialysis and I overheard the nurse saying, why would you want to do that? You have to do everything for yourself. Of course, I didn't intervene because I was just a hemo nurse. I had no experience with independent dialysis. But now, the last two years I've been on independent, if I had to go back, I would be more uh, confident to intervene and explain more to the nurse and the patient the benefits of independent dialysis because hemo can be very hard for a lot of patients. So I think there's more freedom and more self-control and autonomy doing independent dialysis. I, I agree with Dino. Um, just recently, I heard that uh, one of the um, patients had asked one of the nurses, oh, tell me about home dialysis. And they're like, actually, I, I don't know what to tell you. They, they didn't actually have any information. So I think that's, that's a big problem, the education that they have. So, so how, how, how should we address that? Because it is true. Because patients, you know, start, a lot of patients start in, uh, on, on in-center hemodialysis. And they're there for four hours, three times a week, and they have a community connection with the, the members of the treatment team. So as you're saying, you know, those, those nurses are being asked about um, home dialysis and are being asked about different aspects of their care. So how, how do we start with the solutions to that? I think in services to the hemo staff would be good because I, I don't think there's funding to float the hemo nurses over to independent all the time because hemo is always short. So I don't think that's going to happen. But in services, you know, to expose the hemo in center staff to the other modalities, I think would help. Maybe a couple of champions in each area that has had that extra education. Right. Yeah. And also maybe um, having a nurse that does the education be notified when a patient is expressing interest to maybe organize a session outside of, of the in-center treatment and sort of have a, an education pathway that can take place. Oh, some questions coming in from the audience here. Yeah, we're getting Slido questions here. Awesome, keep them coming. Uh, so I'll put a couple of them together here. How do we tackle the nephrologist bias about home dialysis? Where do we start? Oh. Uh, and aligned maybe with that a little bit, when patients crash onto hemodialysis, is there, or there is an increased, uh, or sorry, is there an increased resistance or bias against home therapies 
whether it be from the clinical side or from the patient side. Start with there. Okay, so I'll, maybe I'll do the first one and maybe Chris can tackle the second one. Um, well, I face this battle every day of my career. Um, and I see uh, nephrologists that are, do have some reservations about home. I think that bringing the stories of our patients back to the nephrologists, like the one I showed you, is really empowering to show how patients can do well on home dialysis. And I think that's where the champion in the program comes in. So I work really closely with uh, Mina, who does all of our modality education in our program. She sees all the patients in need of education. And sometimes she'll come up to me and she'll say, you know, Dr. So-and-so said a couple of things to the patient that really were a little bit concerning to me. And I still think that this patient can do home dialysis. So I'll sometimes uh, go in and do an education session and book a session uh, to meet with a patient with, with that other nephrologist's permission just to talk about, about home dialysis. So I think, um, as Chris said, the more we standardize things, the more we make sure that uh, modality decision-making is really a team approach and shared decision-making um, with the patient, but involving the whole team. Um, I, encourage, I encourage all of you, if you see somebody that's really interested in home, um, challenge the nephrologist on that. Same question for Eldon. Yeah. Uh, I I think um, you have to start with um, uh, educating the patient. Because, like I said, when I first went on uh, hemodialysis, I had no idea I had the option of doing home dialysis. So if you uh, put everything out forward, I think but people have a, a better idea of making your choice. But. And what do, you, what do you guys think from the nursing side? I'm very old school. You don't challenge the doctors. The doctors make the decisions and you just follow. <laughs> so not true. So, so not true. No. <laughs> so I often work in the renal unit and in home therapies, at, like now at the moment. And I think but if a patient asked me about a home therapy and I'd say, what, what's your nephrologist told you in the past? And they said, oh, they said, I'm not suitable. I'd ask them more questions. Mm -hmm. And then maybe even talk to that nephrologist and say, hey, so-and-so, yeah. they're quite interested in this. So I think it's the nurses having the confidence to challenge the nephrologist. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. We just have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Dr. Singh doesn't look that scary. No, no. But uh, I, I just want to uh, let everybody know that yesterday in clinic, I had to tell Dito he was the boss just so we could carry on. So I'm not sure challenging the nephrologist is really one of the issues at hand. But um, Chris, um, you know, you worked on this crash project where you looked at um, individuals who started dialysis without much history and much education. And when they crash onto hemo, um, is there an increased resistance to bias against home therapies um, on the clinical side or patient side? Because they're people who haven't had time to kind of get used to things. So um, you're coming to them like at this moment of fear that we've heard about, lack of knowledge. Um, and the first place they get their bias is, of course, in the in-center hemodialysis unit. Yeah, I would agree. I think from a, a patient perspective, you're, you're, you're stunned. There is a lot, uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, but that said, you know, we, we have to have a supportive structure and speak to the patients. And as I mentioned there, uh, and I was trying to highlight is that there will be a majority of patients who it's, it's not the right time to gain that education or to hear about the, all the options at once. But there may be some and uh, who would be willing to hear and be willing to move forward. And I think we, we should afford these patients the opportunity to have that initial choice to gain the education or not. And then we should also be able to revisit it over a specific time to say, you know, it's been two weeks, perhaps you're more clinically stable, you're more adapted, is, it, is this a good time? And we just, uh, again, just touch base gently and allow them to have that option. Uh, and if I, what I suggest is that once they have sh showed some interest, that we're able 
to go down a stream where they get that information and education quickly. Because we know that the longer time on dialysis, the more inertia to overcome. Questions are still flying here. This is great. Uh, so, Eldon, a question for you. You mentioned fears that you had about starting dialysis. Can you describe a little bit some of the fears that you had um, uh, before you started the therapies? When I uh, first started on hemo, uh, after each session, I used to feel like crap. So, you know, after uh, doing uh, one of the fears that doing home dialysis is that how I'm gonna cope with this when I finish and I feel this way. But eventually my body adapted and now I feel good. But still, this is uh, the chances of uh, something happening to me and I, if I can't uh, do anything. But we have a, a number I can always call Dino and he can uh, <laughs> help me out. <laughs> But yep. <laughs> that makes that's sense. it. All right. Uh, there's a, a theme in a number of the questions that have come in, and this is probably for the nephrologists here. Remuneration and payment for home therapies, and does this enter into the bias? Uh, do we get paid differently for in-center dialysis oh. versus home therapies? Um, so first of all, I just want to ask, what's this app called again? Slider? Slido. I think nephrologists should get messages through Slido about <laughs> home dialysis candidacy um, if we're all worried about, uh, uh, about addressing this. Because uh, I, I would say that I think that I, I'd like to think that in Canada, uh, at least uh, nephrologists are reimbursed similarly in Ontario, and, and I think it's the same in BC, um, for managing patients on either therapy. So in Canada, I don't think that it does play as much of a role. Um, in terms of influencing modality decision-making. But in parts of the world, uh, if you're a nephrologist and you own a, a hemodialysis unit, um, sometimes those unfilled chairs can be lost profits for you. Um, and I would, be, I would struggle to say that that may or may not influence modality uh, decisions. And in the U.S., where all of a sudden um, there was a big change in the reimbursement that, that favored home dialysis, the home dialysis numbers in the U.S. are, are just skyrocketing. And I don't think a whole bunch of home dialysis eligible patients immigrated from Canada to the U.S. Um, over the last five or six years. I just think that on, you know, financial aspects definitely impact uh, modality distribution. And it's uh, you know, reimbursement at the clinic level and also at the patient level. But I'd like to think in Canada, for the most part, those don't really play a role. And Chris, do you want to tackle it for the BC model? Because we are a little bit different than Ontario in terms of our remuneration. Uh, it, sorry. In what sense? Don't mean to do it. No. So in BC, there is a difference that we're paid about one third for our community dialysis patients versus and our PD patients or our home hemo patients than an in-center. So there is a potential bias from a physician fee uh, perspective for this. Although, again, I would echo Dr. Pearl's thoughts that I hope that's not the case. And I think the Ontario, when you guys did the transition. It, it, yeah, it did to change fee, and there was no impact when uh, it equalized on, on the distribution of home dialysis. It, historically, there was a difference. My question here. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that um, home dialysis patients are being transported by handy dart from senior homes or senior communities to a dialysis center. Are there consideration given by Reno BC of uh, making home dialysis available in senior centers, either um, like with a nurse present so that it's not a home dialysis, but a dialysis, but at the center, uh, or even regular home dialysis? Thank you. So I'll take that one because uh... <laughs> I don't think we have a systematic plan for that in place. There have been a number of individual programs around the province that have attempted uh, to have facility. And there are, and it is happening in certain jurisdictions, I should say that. It's not that it isn't happening, but I don't know that we have as much of a systematic approach to that. But I think it is something that we have been con 
having in the back of the mind that we need to be probably looking at from an extension of the home therapies, both for PD with facilities to be able to provide PD for um, uh, for for uh, residents in a in a long term care facility, as well as for uh, patients on hemodialysis. And I know in Toronto there is. Um, uh, quite a robust, I think, um, facility or long-term care facility-based hemodialysis program that I think is somewhat of an extension of the home program. Is that right, Jeff? Um, so there's there are some pilot programs for hemodialysis in uh, in nursing homes, and one of the hospitals in Ontario is piloting that. Um, but we do have robust, you know, PD programs already well established. Uh, each program partners with one or one long-term care uh, facility to to um, uh, have PD patients uh, if they need to go into long-term care. But chemo, I think, is a little bit uh, uh, something that's a little bit newer and being piloted. The, uh, may, I, may I have a follow-up question? The, I have asked uh, uh, several senior homes. I'm considering moving into one in the next few years. Yeah. And it's a cost question for them to have a room set aside uh, with the equipment available. So uh, my question to Reno BC is really, are they considering uh, funding for that in the future at least? Uh, then I think it would, would, it would simplify uh, the hemodialysis for a lot of in, inpatients. Yeah, noted. I would say, why don't I say noted at this point in time? I don't know I can speak that we have a strategy or a, or a, a concrete answer for that, but it is something that we recognize as a gap in care. Yeah. I will just say on the island, we have the summit, uh, which is a long-term care with hemodialysis itself, which has been piloted with Dr. Schachter and the group there, which has worked really uh, quite well. Um, that said, we've also had some patients uh, inquiring into PD in the same facility. And we've problem solved one or two, but it is not the norm. And part of it is just the logistics of having um, the staff there trained or having assisted PD come in because it is a third party. So we're working out the, the logistics about that, but it's definitely hopefully a goal to come. Um, I'm just going to um, mention a comment that came on uh, the Slido women kind of extrapolated into a question. Um, somebody commented that they believe uh, clients on hemodialysis feel that they are locked into one form of dialysis and don't realize that they can change. So not necessarily just the people who crash into dialysis, but even people who made a choice to be on hemodialysis. And I do notice sometimes in my uh, kidney clinic, my pre-dialysis kidney clinic, people are thinking that they have to make a decision once for the rest of their lives. Um, and I think, you know, as Eldon pointed out, um, you know, it was two years, I think, before he transitioned to PD from InCenter HD. So nothing happened in those two years. So I think we just need to look back at the fundamentals of our education and make sure yeah. that um, we're doing things yeah. differently. No, and I agree. And um, <clears throat> I do find on the island we don't have that many navigator hours. So I think that would be something really beneficial. To improve, yeah. You know, the other thing I was thinking about as Eldon was speaking, and which is really important, is if somebody, you know, you said, Eldon, you didn't feel very good after hemodialysis, correct? When I first, start, when I first started, I, the first uh, couple of weeks, I feel pretty yeah. crappy. And, and some people, like, really take, you know, there's this whole concept about recovery time after hemodialysis, and some people feel wiped. And you just wonder how many people are out there that feel that way that they may not realize that maybe a home therapy might minimize those symptoms. So um, I, agree with, I agree with you. It's not about like a, once, a one and done. You make your decision. You make it for the rest of your, your, your um, kidney journey. We, we should constantly come back to patients to talk to them. And maybe some of the screening tools, like you know, people who have poor recovery time, um, people who feel really unwell, people who are struggling with access issues, I can't tell you how many people I see time after time after time struggling with vascular access where maybe, you know, things would be much more seamless on a home therapy like PD that we need to consistently revisit. And I tell people, you know, it's okay to make a first decision, but it's not something we can't course correct if the therapy is not working for you. And I think people 
I would be anxious if somebody made me like, you know, you're going left, you're going right for the rest of your, uh, your kidney journey. And we, we just have to tell people we can always course correct um, and, and make a change if we need to. Can I just say something? Um, I do find that people think that PD is the first step and they're ultimately going to end up on hemo anyway. So why not just start on the hemo and just cut that bit out? Right. I've heard that. Yeah, hopefully some people will get a kidney transplant and PD will be a bridge to a kidney transplant. Unfortunately, we are running to the last couple of minutes here. Uh, oh. I think we could go on a lot longer. Uh, there is one question which I'll slightly paraphrase and I'd like to ask this to everyone on the panel. Should patients be incentivized to receive home-based therapies, PD or home hemo? Should there be an incentive, some sort of an incentive provided for patients? Can we start that way? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a chair. Um, so uh, there's obviously different incentives. Um, most of the time when we talk about incentivize, we're talking about some kind of monetary or some advantage that they get. Maybe they move up on the transplant list. I don't want to suggest anything like that. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I don't think that they necessarily need incentivization because I think that people um, are making the choice that's best for their lives as they understand it. Um, and so I don't think incentives will make them maybe overlook one thing in favor of another. And I'd really rather them make the best choice for their life. But um, I do think that um, we need to make sure that uh, we provide enough support for them to feel comfortable with the decision that they're going to make, regardless of which one it is. So that's my answer. I don't think they should be getting any monetary or any other incentives, but I think we, like you say, need to be there to support them and do the best we can. Yeah. I don't think uh, you should be given an incentive, but, you, but the, you can look at the positive things you can do. Like for me, I, I can take day trips. I can do all kinds of things without going to doing Dean at the hospital. So to me, it's a positive to uh, just doing PD at all. Yeah, I don't think you can incentivize it monetarily anyway. I think that education and from VGH standpoint, we, the other thing we have a hard time also is once they're on hemo too long, you can't even move them anywhere else. So I think we need to educate them, maybe move them over, expose them to independent therapies, and then they'll go from there. It's a no for me for incentivization. I think that uh, this would change the whole parameter for informed and being unbiased. And I, I think it adds an element that we uh, would push people towards a specific uh, modality they may not be best to. Yeah, I agree about the no incentive. But I do, I do think that interesting, um, you know, tax credits and electricity and water costs, people shouldn't be out because they're doing a home therapy. And we should, you know, make sure that we put those things in place, even support for care partners in some capacity who are participating in care at home. Um, we need to policy for those kinds of uh, tax incentives. I get there, I use the word incentive, but sort of tax, um, tax issues so that people aren't net negative from a financial aspect doing um, dialysis at home. Can I just quickly add to that in terms of patient costs of doing home dialysis, that there's um, novel costs now with waste disposal. So we haven't really characterized those, and I'd love to see the new version of the report coming out, including that. That is great. Thank you. I have the unfortunate task of also having to close the session, uh, and I think we could carry this on. I, I'd like to thank all the panel members um, uh, for their uh, participation. I. I also want to thank everyone in the audience. Uh, that was really wonderful. It's hard to have a, a, a participation session in a room this size, but I think we were actually able to do that. So thank you very much for the perspectives. I'm going to